The topics and opinions expressed in the following show are solely those of the hosts and their guests and not those of W4CY Radio, its employees, or affiliates. We make no recommendations or endorsements for radio show programs, services, or products mentioned on air or on our web. No liability, explicit or implied, shall be extended to W4CY Radio, its employees, or affiliates. Any questions or comments should be directed to those show hosts. Thank you for choosing W4CY Radio. Who is January Jones? She is not a young, beautiful, talented actress on Mad Men. She is not an older, gorgeous, exotic dancer from the Johnny Carson Show. She is an author, and she wrote, Thou Shall Not Wine, the 11th Commandment, that reached number one at Amazon.com. She is a reality TV golf personality with World High Stakes Golf televised on HDNet. She is a humorist and winologist expert. She is your featured host today on January Jones Sharing Success Stories. So sit back, relax, and get ready to laugh and listen to Ms. Jones with her eclectic roster of guests as you learn life's lessons. These stories plus sharing equals success. Welcome and remember, beware. Because you are entering the no whining world of January Jones. Hello, I'm January Jones, and I would like to welcome you to our podcast today. Now, for my listeners, let me ask you a question Would you like to learn what it's like? to be a laughter yoga instructor. Do you even know what a laughter yoga instructor is or what he does? Do you wonder how one becomes a laughter yoga instructor? Can you imagine what it takes to be a musician, an actor, a humorist, and to be so talented? Have you ever wanted to meet someone who can tell you how to be successful? Well, if you can answer yes or maybe to any of these questions, then you are in the right place. And I'd like to welcome you to January Jones sharing success stories. Now it's time to sit back, relax, go get some wine, get some cheese and crackers. You can join me now in the No Wine Zone. Let me tell you a little bit about my guest today. He is a dear friend, and I'm thrilled to have him back with me on the show, and I'm thrilled to have him with us so we can actually see him. After a background in traditional yoga, my guest founded the Laughter Yoga Institute and became a certified laughter yoga leader in 2005. He promptly founded the Western world's first laughter club to meet seven days per week. He is the author of nine books on laughter. It is my pleasure to welcome to our show today, my dear friend, Jeffrey Breyer. Hi, Jeffrey. (laughs) Hi, Jeffrey. Hi, everybody. Thank you for having me back on your show. <laughs> I know. This is basically going to be a laugh-filled uh, podcast, <laughs> for sure. Hey, Let my me... first time on your show with the beard. Ah. Okay, that's ah. my first question was going to be, uh, how did the pandemic affect you? Well, obviously, it affected uh, your shaving habits. <laughs> ah, just, let's do the end here. Yes, the pandemic was actually quite a powerful influence had a good big effect on our laughter club, especially mm-hmm. because uh, on the 17th of March, the state of California said, stop gathering together in groups, especially yeah. if you happen to be breathing. And what we've been doing for the previous 15 years was gathering together in a group and laughing, which does involve breathing. So suddenly it was forbidden to do what we had been doing for the previous 15 years. So, uh, Nonetheless, I was dedicated, committed. I, made, I had made a commitment to myself and to life that I would continue to have the laughter experience. So personally, what I did was I just went on Facebook Live mm-hmm. and I broadcast me leading laughter sessions. And sometimes there would be people present with me 
as I did the laughter session. And sometimes it was for whoever was watching and they were all archived so people could see them later if they chose to. So I basically led a laughter session with or without other people in attendance, mm -hmm. physical attendance. Um, and I did 433 of those. I counted every single day for over a year, 360. Oh, wow. And then uh, about a year and a half in the government said it was okay to gather together in groups if you wear masks. So that our laughter club started meeting again. Um, Wow. Year now. That's quite a, that would be quite a effect on your business, uh, probably your morale. And, but it's wonderful how you manage to adapt. And, and that's one of the things I've commented on about the pandemic. Out of such a horrible thing, a lot of positive things have come forth. Uh, do you agree? Uh, you know, whatever life gives us is an opportunity. And sometimes the opportunity is to be resourceful. And sometimes the opportunity is to uh, crumble in a puddle of tears and go, I can't handle this. And they're, they're all okay. And everything in between is okay. But um, mm -hmm. it's whenever we have challenges, it's, a, it's an opportunity to remind us what's really important, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. what we want to continue doing. Now, I know many people when they were stuck in pandemic, uh, what they had to do or what they did was they made up a home gym and they exercised and they got in the best physical shape of their lives. I was not one of those people. <laughs> I, well, I think you and I are in the same category. <laughs> yeah. But I was committed to laughing every day. Yeah. So that, that I, I did. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you from my own experience that laughing does not burn as many calories as jogging yeah. or, or, you know, working out at the gym for 45 minutes, which is what I used to do. <laughs> <laughs> so I got, a, I got a little extra padding on. I know. Back <laughs> out. We've all, we're all in the same boat on that one. But, you know, if you did 431 sessions, you, you more than did your share. Um, share with my listeners a little bit about your background. Tell us where your success story began, where you were born, and who were the early influencers in your life? Okay, thanks. And uh, I'd imagine some of your listeners may not even know what laughter yoga is. Yes. So I'll include that in my little introduction. Um, we're going to go into that in quite a bit detail. <laughs> okay, well, I'll touch on it. So I was born in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, because my father was from the East Coast, although my mother was from the West Coast. They met while he was out here on the West Coast. That's where I am now. But he happened to go back to Pennsylvania for his uh, residency. He was a doctor. And so I happened to be born in Pennsylvania. I lived there the first three months of my life. And then the family moved back to California and uh, never went back to Pennsylvania to live. So basically, I'm a California boy who happened to be born in Pennsylvania. And um, my father and my, my mother were involved in what was then called humanistic psychology or the human potential movement. So they explored um, interesting forms of consciousness, meditation, yoga, uh, gestalt therapy, humanistic psychology. And I, so I was born into this open-mindedness about about different ways of being, right? So it was very, it was not a very structured childhood in terms of I had to be a certain way when I grew up. Uh -huh. It was more, my parents encouraged me and my brother and sister to discover whatever we felt was our path and wow. they would support us in that, however that would be. And it turned out that they, they did give me piano lessons, which I enjoyed and I ended up becoming a pianist and I still play the piano and compose. Mm -hmm. uh, I also discovered regular yoga, traditional stretchy yoga, when I was a kid. And uh, from an early age, I learned or I realized that I really enjoyed it when people laughed. So uh, <laughs> I would do funny things or I would you know, make a funny face in camera when they took a picture, when they were on a vacation, a holiday. Mm -hmm. And then when people would laugh, when they looked at the picture later, I would make a mental note. Oh, this laughing thing is a good thing. So uh, it came to pass that when I was 16, two major things occurred. One, I started working at the Renaissance Pleasure Fair, at first in a musical group, but that group 
rapidly evolved into a comedy group. Mm -hmm. And so I found myself performing on stages and having audiences laugh. So this was a, a heady brew. Uh, <laughs> when you're up there in front of 500,000 people and something you do makes all those people laugh, maybe even oh. fall down off their hay bale laughing, it's like, <laughs> ooh, I like that. I want to figure out how to do that more. Yeah. <laughs> on the other hand, I became a comedy performer. Meanwhile, near the end of my year, 16th year, I discovered traditional yoga and began <laughs> practicing that. And that turned into actually becoming a teacher of traditional stretchy yoga. So with traditional yoga, I felt more health, better, mm -hmm. uh, you know, more clarity of thought. Um, I could focus my concentration better. Uh, and through the stage performing, I got people to laugh and feel ecstatically happy. Mm -hmm. So I had two careers going simultaneously. My performing career evolved into doing lookalikes. I did impersonations of Charlie Chaplin and Stan Laurel of Laurel and Hardy and Inspector Cluzo, as well yeah. as original characters. Meanwhile, I was also teaching traditional yoga, you know, not at the same time. <laughs> in my yoga classes, people were feeling all healthy and blissful. And in my stage performances, people were, were laughing. So um, in 2004, I learned about this thing that combined laughing with yoga. We call it laughter yoga. So I ended up studying with the creators of the work in Switzerland in 2005. Uh, and then I came back and started this laughter club because I felt like it was the best of both worlds. Oh, uh, for sure. You know, we're going to take a break. Oh. And we come back. We're going to talk about the best of both worlds. And in the meantime, I'd like people to look at my book, Thou Shalt Not Wine, The Eleventh Commandment. <laughs> Lately, there's a whining epidemic in our world. People are even whining about whining. Are you sick and tired of listening to everyone whining all the time? So was January Jones, the author of Thou Shall Not Whine, the 11th commandment that reached number one at Amazon.com. Ms. Jones based her book on a survey of the top 10 things that people whine about at all ages and all stages of life. January is a success coach that can tell you how to help others. When you buy Thou Shall Not Whine, the 11th commandment, you'll find out what people whine about and how to stop them from whining. This is the perfect gift book to give or get for any occasion. Thou Shall Not Whine was voted the best gift to be given anonymously for those special people in your life. Ms. Jones is an internationally known author in the style of Irma Bombeck, specializing in housewife humor with her book being published in Korea and China. You can find Thou Shall Not Wine at Amazon.com. Welcome back to the No Wine Zone with my guest, Jeffrey Breyer, who is definitely not a whiner because he is a real winner. Jeff, before we begin, could you please share with our listeners your contact info with our fans, and that'll be displayed on our chat line below so they can contact you. Okay. Here it is, real easy to remember. Okay. Joyfulb.com. Joyful That's a single letter of B. J-O-Y-F-U-L-B.com www.joyfulbee.com. That will get you to my webpage. It's specifically for the Laughter Club, but attached to the Laughter Club, it's all the other stuff. And if you want to uh, write to me, uh, joyfulbee at cox.net, at cox.net. And then I can give you more links for my stuff. I'm on YouTube. I have hundreds of videos on YouTube, including things that show my comedy performing, uh, Ch Chaplin and Laurel, and Laurel of Laurel and Hardy, uh, other fun stuff. Um, and, and you also do Costo and Beethoven, right? Pluto. Yes, I do Beethoven too. That's not a comedy character, but uh, that was a way I couldn't combine my piano playing skills oh. with uh, a, a characterization. I, so I have a wonderful costume. Uh, I, since I've grown the beard, I haven't done too much of the characters, but mm -hmm. uh, I have a great costume. And I, so I am Beethoven. I got a wig and everything, and I tell the story. Yeah. <laughs> and all of this is on YouTube. Uh, not everything, but not everything. <laughs> <laughs> let's bits and pieces is all. 
<laughs> you know, before we came on the air, I was thinking back to the first time uh, Leif and I met you when we were on that AATH cruise many years ago. And I, it was so much fun meeting you. And you were so much fun on the dance floor. I'll never forget. You had orange sneakers on. <laughs> 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 and every woman there wanted to dance with you, of course. And of course, we all got to do that. It was really, that was a fun cruise, wasn't it? It was. It was great. Um, yeah. The AETH people tend to want to have fun, you know. I often I think you'll find that uh, in life some people are more concerned about what other people think about them mm -hmm. than they are concerned about enjoying life on their on their own terms. Yeah. So when people tend to laugh a lot, it can really diminish their the the illness of taking things too seriously. Mm -hmm. Over seriousness as a condition just tends to make our lives less joyful. So yeah. for when we adopt the, the uh, philosophy that, you know, life is to celebrate, not to just figure out, then when someone says, hey, you want to dance? You're more likely to go, okay, as long as nothing's broken, yes, I'll. I'll. <laughs> so yeah, I, didn't, I, don't, I don't dance very well as far as technically, but I, I have a good time dancing. And so that's people who want to dance with me tend to people who go, well, he may not know the steps, but we'll have fun. Yeah, for That's sure. Right, yeah. yeah, and I remember on the cruise every morning we'd get up at some ungodly hour and go <laughs> to our laughter classes. Yeah. And it kind of just set the tone for the whole day. Plus, it got everyone really closely uh, together and united, and it just was a good group experience. Uh, now that the pandemic's over, you're offering classes seven days a week, aren't you? That's right, on the beach in Laguna Beach, California. And we laugh, it's absolutely guaranteed that you will laugh because we do laughing as though it were a form of exercise. So for example, we might do an exercise called cell phone laughter, which is take a cell phone or just pretend you have a cell phone, it could be anything, there's a checkbook, and you put it by your ear and you laugh, ha, 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 and you share with the other people, hey, check out my, check this, ha, 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 ha. So, because it's an exercise of laughing, you do laugh. And through the playful interaction, the laughter becomes real. So it becomes laughing from having fun with other people who are laughing with you. You don't have to have comedy. You don't have to have a sense of humor. You can do this with people who don't speak your language mm -hmm. or don't have the same cultural references. So they won't get jokes because they don't know what a buggy whip is. And they don't, they've never been on an elevator or they've never been to a, you know, Walmart. Uh, if you state jokes that depend upon cultural references, people from different cultures won't get them. So we don't do that. What we do is, you know, wave while laughing. <laughs> um, well, you know, before you do, I'm going to have you demonstrate all the different laughs as the show goes on. But let's backtrack a little bit because you started telling us about how you came from regular yoga Mm -hmm. And uh, who who is your instructor and your who who did you train with? In traditional yoga, my primary instructor was a fellow named Swami Turiyananda, who ran the Integral Yoga Institute of okay. Santa Cruz, California. I was okay. a student at university. He taught there, and I also studied with him in the community. So he was my mentor. Um, First, he was, you know, a teacher, and then I took all of his classes because I just loved the traditional yoga. And eventually, he asked me to take over some of his classes. So, poof, I became a yoga teacher through experience. Um, so that was my that now of traditional yoga. Now of of laughter yoga, my mentor was the founder of the work, Dr. Madan Kataria, and his lovely wife Madhuri Kataria. Uh, they're from India, but I studied with them in Switzerland in 2005. They, they used to travel around the world quite a bit giving training programs. Now they don't travel so much. They, most of their work is in Asia, mostly India, and people go to them. Uh -huh. too. And also they do stuff on, on you know, mm -hmm. on the internet. So they, they, they're at home in India and we're watching them wherever we are on the planet, different time zones. Uh -huh. He does other workshops and stuff. And oh, this one my book, it's called The Laughter Yoga Book. It's my little teeny tiny book. It's all complete in one thing. And here's my bigger book, The Laughter Mat. You said I have nine books. Here's 
Latin revolutionaries translated into Italian. Oh. The great big anthology of laughter exercises also oh. translated into Italian. Okay. I can't say it's too long. The title is too long. And then here's my favorite. That's why I'm going to show you of my books. This is a collection of quotes, and it features my mother, who was also a laughter yoga teacher, passed oh. away two years ago. Boy, I want to talk about a reason to be sad and miserable? Well, I was for a while. Mm -hmm. COVID happened. I couldn't meet with my friends on the beach. And then my mom passed away. And my mom was a great, great friend as well as helped run laughter yeah. club. So mm -hmm. I, had, I had plenty of reasons to be miserable. And part of the time I was miserable because sure. I was sad yeah. for missing my mom. But that didn't stop mm -hmm. from laughing. Were you, were you able to be with her when she passed or was... Oh, we lived together. I helped. You know, it was it was very sweet. I was her caregiver, and um, I was with her when she took her last breath and talked gotcha. to her about you know, now you're not alive anymore. <laughs> Let's listen to some Beethoven, and we listened to some Beethoven. We talked about you know I talked. I yeah. imagine her responding. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, it was very sweet. And then I was you know intermittently very sad for many months, but I also. Mm -hmm. Took care of things and I continued to laugh every day. The first couple of days were especially hard to laugh. And if you could see the Facebook pages, the Facebook broadcasts I was doing, you would you know see that you know the guys fighting, the guys fighting to keep laughing. And yeah. I, I would find that uh, what I could do is I would start to cry for just two or three seconds, and then I would come back and I would talk and laugh again, and then try cut, feel miserable, sad for three or four seconds. And then it just, it would flow because that's one of the things that happens from doing this laughter work is you let yourself feel an emotion and you just keep going in the flow of emotion. But it's so it's more pleasant to flow with happy emotions than with miserable ones. It's so special for you to share this because so many of our listeners are growing through grief and have trouble processing the process, which we all know most of us have certainly been through it at one time or another. And uh, laughter yoga is something that is a positive thing. If you are in grief or if you have friends or family, it is something you can recommend that they look into. And I think uh, Jeffrey is a good mentor as far as that goes. And you have his contact information. So he's very easy to get a hold of. And he's, he'd be a wonderful person to help anyone with a grief uh, situation. That's my plug for you, dear. <laughs> okay, now yeah. let's... Let's go back to combining regular uh, yoga with laughter yoga. Did you find a lot of resistance? Was it hard to do? How did that go? No. When, when I was quite, when I was first studying traditional yoga mm -hmm. uh, in the late 1970s, um, there was considerable resistance because people thought it was a religious practice. Oh, yeah. if, they, if they did it, they would somehow lose their mind and become you know, worship elephants or something. <laughs> so we had to let people know that it came from a philosophy, yes, and it's nice to know what the philosophy is, but it's basically a form of exercise. You don't have to know the philosophy in order to do the exercise. You don't, have, when you're doing a Tai Chi move and they call it, you know, embracing the, the bird or whatever, it doesn't matter if you know that it's called embracing the bird. It, you can just do the movement. Um, right. And so same thing with traditional yoga. You can just do the postures, mm -hmm. asana, they're called, and you don't need to know the philosophy behind that. And you will get benefits just from doing the exercise. So um, that has evolved in time. Now, at least in, in the U.S., there's very small pockets of resistance against the word yoga. Yeah. Um, people, they feel okay. They say it's just exercise. But yeah. the combination of laughter and yoga Still, a lot of people don't, they don't get it. How can you have yoga? Oh, yeah. How can yeah. you have that and laugh at the same time? And the, the simple answer is what laughter yoga takes from traditional yoga is the consciousness of breathing and how when you breathe, you influence how you feel, right? So if you breathe quickly, it's stimulating. If you breathe slowly, 
It's calming. So in laughter yoga, we do a stimulating breath. But instead of breathing silently, we breathe with laughter. <laughs> so it's stimulating. Now at the end of a good laughter session, after 15 minutes or so of laughing, you'll do a guided relaxation where you will consciously be calm and peaceful. So yes. you'll have stimulation of the activity and the cool down of the relaxation at the end of the activity, which is in a, ideally in any exercise situation, that's what you'll do. You'll you'll warm up, you'll have intense workshop workout, and then you'll cool down. Sure, sure. Well, so, right now, right now we're going to cool down. All right. <laughs> we're going to talk about my book, and for people who wondered who killed Kennedy, who had the money, the motive, and the means, here's the answer. Let me ask you a question. Are you still wondering who killed Kennedy? Over 50 years later, the assassination is still a mystery. It is unfinished business for our country. Now, get ready for a theory that you've never heard before, but will make more sense than any other conspiracy theory that you've ever heard in the past. January Jones speaks the unspeakable in her book, Jackie, Ari, and Jack, The Tragic Love Triangle, connecting Jackie and Aristotle Onassis romantically prior to JFK's assassination. Did you know that Ari was Jackie's guest in the White House during the JFK funeral? He was the only non-family member who was invited by Jackie to stay there during the funeral. Aristotle Onassis was one of the wealthiest men in the world, with the means, the motive, and the money to order an assassination that was the perfect crime of the last century. Ari needed class, and Jackie needed cash. They were perfect for each other. Now, what is Camelot? It is but another tragic love triangle. Jackie, Ari, and Jack is available at JanuaryJones.com, Amazon.com, and Audiobooks.com, read by Ms. Jones. Welcome back with my dear friend, Jeffrey Dreyer, who is the head of the Laughter Yoga Institute, and he's down in Laguna Beach. Now, Jeffrey, when someone signs up to go to a class, and, and my next question is, the classes are free, right? Uh, uh, yeah, the classes on the beach are free. I teach in the community for some classes for which there's a charge. Uh -huh. What we call the Laughter Club. Okay. Is is free of charge. Laughter classes, seminars, workshops, training programs are often for a, a charge. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, that makes sense. I mean, you've got to make a living. <laughs> uh, nice. a, a typical class, how many people is ideal or is there any limit? Uh, the limit is how that the people can all see and hear the instructor because the, the person who's leading the exercise then you need to see them so they can show you, you know, the way it looks like this. Ready, set, go. <laughs> okay. uh, but there's no maximum number. It just depends on the space. Yeah. Um, minimum number is two or three, but ideal number is probably around eight. eight. Because okay. if you have, if they have more than a half dozen people, they never feel like there's pressure that you are, everyone's watching you to laugh. Yeah. If there's only two or three people, then you can, you, one can feel like, oh gosh, if I don't laugh, everyone's going to notice. Once mm -hmm. you're lost in a group of six or eight, if I don't laugh, no one's going to notice. That's yeah. ideal, uh, especially mm -hmm. for beginners. And bigger groups are even more fun because you can move around and meet a whole bunch of new people. Yeah, I, mm -hmm. You don't meet new people, but you interact with people. And mm -hmm. as we were mentioning earlier, just by interacting with people and laughing with them, you feel friendly towards them. So it's it's amazing that by laughing with total strangers, a stranger becomes your friend, maybe not a real close friend, but a friendly friend. Mm -hmm. And then you feel connected to them and you want to help them and they want to help you. And it just takes a couple minutes of sharing laughter. So <laughs> it's a real have you, have you ever been a, a matchmaker in your classes? Have yes, ever, we, we've had a few. Uh, people came to a laughter club for their first date uh -huh. and they, they got married, had children. Oh my uh, gosh. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's happened. 
Now I know during the pandemic, obviously they had to wear masks and, and how does it work out now? Is it optional or how it's many up. wear masks and how many don't? It's optional um, because we meet outside in the, by the ocean, uh -huh. uh, there's a lot of exchange of air. So now I'd say one out of 20 wears a mask. Uh -huh. um, maybe one out of 10, depending on the week. Yeah. But almost everyone, especially people who've done it in the past, uh, they all feel fine with, yeah. without a mask because it's in the open air and there's always the sea breeze, you know, always a breeze. And that, and also it's easy to keep distance. You're yeah. not, you're not crowded into a facility. Okay, you've given my listeners a, a little brief sample. Let's go through uh, the six type of laughs. Uh, the first was the greeting laugh, which I think you did earlier. <laughs> okay. 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 So here's, and in India, we'll do this. So we'll do each laugh now for five seconds. Okay. So okay. the other way they greet each other is they put their hands together in front of their heart and they bow slightly. Okay. And they'll say the word namaste, but we'll do it while just laughing. Ready? Okay. Five seconds of laughing? Start. <laughs> you good? That was about five seconds. Okay. okay. What do you have as the second category? I Let have line laughter. A line laughter. Is that a growl? Lion? Lion. Yeah. So with the lion, you stick out your tongue, lift up your eyebrows, and you make your hands like the claws of a lion, and uh -huh. you laugh with your tongue stuck out. Okay, five <laughs> seconds. Ready? Growl. <laughs> Very good. Relax. Very so you good. To your yoga pose, the lion pose. Stretches you out, but you usually do it silently. <sighs> we do it with laughing. <laughs> it's even better. It yeah. feel, makes you feel better. And how do we do the humming laughter? Creation? So that's one where your lips will be closed, but you'll be laughing anyway. If you could hear it up close, it sound like this. <laughs> so let's do that for five seconds, okay? Laugh, start. <laughs> 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 Good, relax. Okay. And and you do all of these in each class, right? Well, different ones. There are hundreds and hundreds of laughs, and which ones we do will depend upon the mood of the instructor. Usually we start with some kind of greeting laugh. It could be namaste, it could be waving, it could be the handshake. We haven't yeah. done handshake much since COVID, but we used to do that. Queen okay. of England. <laughs> yeah, I like that one. Yeah. It's a mellow, relaxed one. And then what about how do you do the silent laughter? So silent laughter is that you act as though you are laughing, but you don't make any sound. Like the background could be you're at a slumber party and the grown-ups have said, You kids are making too much noise, keep it quiet. So you laugh anyway, but silently. I'll demonstrate and we'll do it. Ready? Go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, relax. Let that one go. Yeah. That one, I think all of us have done. <laughs> yeah. I, I, you know, I have to do that one <clears throat> whenever we're in a play. And right. sometimes, you know, how your laughter can just take over and you feel like you have to leave. <clears throat> That's when you need the silent laugh. Now, the other one was the gradient laugh. And gradient. Yeah. Let's take 10 seconds to gra do gradient laughter. So what happens is you start yeah. kind of softly. Yeah. Uh, ha, 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 ha. And you gradually build up. Ha, 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 and then it being really big. <laughs> okay, so we'll take 10 seconds to go from soft okay. laughter to okay. hysterical laughter. Ready? Start. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> <laughs> Got it. Good, we like it. That one's fun. So we um, have longer, like a typical laughter session is about 15 minutes of laughing. So okay. we could gritty yeah. laughter and go soft. And then a loud, and then go back to soft. 
Oh, okay, up and down. Thirty seconds to do that whole um, continuum of laughing. Okay, and then the last one is heart to heart laughter. So ideally, you do this with people, and and you don't worry about COVID, but you you hug them and feel your oh. heart to their heart. So let's do it now with an an object like oh, oh look my two DVDs. Oh, <laughs> so okay. Club. And, okay, so you hug it and you laugh. Ready? Laugh. Ah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh, it's something. Ah. Uh, <laughs> Person or at least a dog. But, uh, <laughs> I, I laugh very easily, but I can tell from having been in your class, it is contagious. Once yeah. you have more than three or four people doing it, sometimes you can't stop. Uh, right now, we're going to take a break. And my next spot is about two of my books that I have written that are some priceless personalities. And these are all guests who have been on my show through the years. And Jeffrey is featured in Chapter 3, Volume 2. Have you ever met someone who was unforgettable? Someone who has touched your heart and soul? People who have faced difficult problems? People who have struggled to find solutions? People who fearlessly shared their stories? People who have not only informed you, but inspired you. People who have priceless personalities. I have been fortunate to host an internet radio talk show called January Jones Sharing Success Stories. And it has been my privilege to interview hundreds of guests. My guests have shared their stories, their struggles, their secrets, and their successes in their own words. In this book, we're talking about people dealing with problems such as incest, molestation, runaway kids, child abuse, drug abuse, polygamy, unemployment, scandal, and starting over. Then there are my guests dealing with difficult physical struggles such as blindness, cancer, and birth defects that are beyond traumatic. My guests have all been exciting, eclectic, and energizing. They have amazed, amused, and even astonished me. I have adored getting to meet them, and I adore sharing them with you. Attention all listeners. Priceless Personalities, Success Stories Shared by January Jones, Volume 2 is now available at Amazon.com in paperback and Kindle editions. You'll be able to meet 10 amazing people who will be sharing their own personal stories with all their struggles, successes, and solutions sprinkled with lots of humor and hope. Priceless Personalities features a teenager who becomes one of the famous Supremes from Motown, a nurse who has a humorist helps people to heal, an inspiring laughter yoga instructor, a mother dealing with the loss of a child, an incredible motivational speaker, a woman who married five times, a gifted paranormal nurse, a wise economist, a funny female humorist, along with an older man sharing his sweet childhood in the deep south. January's guests are all amazing and amusing. You will never forget meeting them. Go to Amazon.com for your own priceless experience. We're back right. visiting with my friend Jeffrey Breyer, who truly is a priceless personality. And I was thrilled to be able to share him in my book with so many people and to share him here on the podcast with you today. <laughs> Okay, Jeffrey, let's talk about the future. Aside from moving and doing all of that, what other projects are upcoming for you? Well, I want to go back to uh, Europe to do a workshop that I was going to do two years ago, April. I call okay. it Laughter Jazz. Ooh, uh, using like elements of jazz improvisation combined with laughter yoga, voluntary laughter, and it's special... What's really special about it is first people learn a kind of a, a language of laughter, different, mm -hmm. different qualities. For example, high, fast laughter, <laughs> slow, low laughter, ho, 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 ho. And then they're combined. So it's kind of like a Dixieland jazz band. You've got the, the clarinet and the bass, oh, okay. uh, the trombone but it's all different kinds of laughter. So part of the challenge is to do it without 
cr cracking up and just laughing completely. But yeah. I think what will happen with this work is the people who are trained will do what they're supposed to do and the audience, everyone else will be laughing hysterically. And then mm -hmm. all the people from the audience say, oh, I want to do that. I want to go next. So I was going to teach this last eight, a year, two years ago, April, uh -huh. uh, to, to lead it in Switzerland and probably in Italy and France. And then the COVID happened and all the airplanes, flights got canceled. So th I hope to do that probably, uh, it's too late for the fall because we're uh -huh. going to fall soon and travel is still awesome. Yeah. Weird. But I hope that by the spring, uh, all over the world, it'll be, be COVID will be enough behind us that I can, I can finally do that. Workshop. Yeah, right. that's just like a fabulous project because I can see it now. It'll be all interactive and everyone will have their instrument, which is their voice. And right. I can see you up there leading it. It'll be <laughs> fabulous. <laughs> and, you know, that'll be something you can put on Facebook and you and do it on YouTube, too. Right. And I think it'd be very popular. It's you know, people have to, during this difficult time, they have to improvise and do different things. And uh, laughter yoga is a, a nice change of pace. So many people, sadly, are depressed, you know, because it's been difficult. And like you, they've lost dear ones. And life, you know, everyone just wants life to get back <clears throat> to normal. And uh, I think I think we're working our way. Get we're getting there slowly but surely. Now, when you look back on your career, do you have any regrets or things that you wish you could do over? Any do overs? <laughs> <laughs> He's yeah. laughing about that. <laughs> be specific about that. Uh, yeah, there were. You know, uh, I'll tell you. I, 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 without m naming any names. Um, <laughs> There were times when I uh, depended on uh, other people to uh, pull equal weight in some of our relationships mm -hmm. in the world of laughter yoga, in my personal life, and so on. And I, I think in, in almost every instance, there was a time when I, if I had been listening to my intuition, and my personal wisdom, I would have said, you know, this isn't working out, and it's time to uh, accept the gifts of this relationship and not expect the other person or organization mm -hmm. to keep moving forward where I hope they'll go. So I think I was optimistic and giving uh, people too much credit. So in hindsight, I wish I had a little earlier in some of my uh, professional relationships, especially, I wish I'd been a little clearer on what was important to me and that I was able to speak to some of my colleagues and say, you know, I need this from you. I want to have this in our, and if, it, if you don't think that's something you can do, I understand. It's great, but let's just move on. Yeah. So uh, three or four times when I wish I had uh, ended things sooner. For, for sure. And, you know, I'll share with you and with everyone, everyone who's come on the show and shared their success stories, pretty much say the same thing that at mm. some point, <laughs> you have to establish boundaries and uh, go forward. My last question is, if you could have dinner with anyone, living or dead, uh, it's besides me, who would it be? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to throw in that they we can speak the same language and that they uh, can hear. So that would be Ludwig von Beethoven. Okay. Uh, because not everyone knows this, but Beethoven was in his late 20s when he was told he was going to go deaf. Okay. But he didn't actually, he wasn't actually completely deaf until he was in his 50s. Really? So he 20 something years gradually losing his sense of hearing. And even after he had gone deaf, he continued to compose music mm -hmm. and expire turn out to be the world all of history so i uh, that's a person i would like to hang out with and ask him how did he stick to his vision mm -hmm. even when he was losing you know the most important feedback he could get which was his hearing yeah. and so the way that he must have had to use his inner resources whether that was what he imagined things sounded like or what he how he felt things yeah. beyond sound that's the conversation I'd like to have. How did Beethoven keep up his keep up his spirits when he met some really daunting challenges? 
Yeah, yeah, that would be that, you know, and actually when I think about people to have dinner with, I think all the people that you've uh, chosen for your uh, tributes, like I would love to have dinner with any one of them. So Laurel, Stan Laurel, Charlie Chaplin. I mean, wouldn't that, that would be a true laugh. Peter Sellers, Peter Sellers as Inspector yeah. Cruz. Oh, that would be so fun. <laughs> well, we can dream. <laughs> so now in closing, I'd like to thank you, Jeffrey Beyer. And uh, I'd like everyone to go to his website and check out Laughter Yoga because it's something that can help you get through difficult times as a pandemic. Dear listeners, I hope you've enjoyed our time together. We have tried to be informative and we certainly have tried to be inspiring by sharing our laughter with you. My upcoming guests will all be eclectic, exciting and energizing. Next Tuesday live at 2 p.m. Eastern time, I'm going to have another humorist on the show. Her name is Jane Jekin Her Herlock and I haven't had her on before. So I'm looking forward to that. Be sure to sign on to my website. Now, my 78-year-old thought for the day. <clears throat> Common sense is like deodorant. The people who need it most never use it. Sense. <laughs> sense, <laughs> get it. sense, get it. <laughs> oh, that's funnier than you even knew. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's my friend Jeffrey. So for now, thank you for entering the No Wine Zone and share our stories and our show with everyone you know. And remember, stop whining and start smiling. And if <clears throat> that doesn't work, then you can just start eating chocolate, lots, lots of chocolate, and remember to keep laughing. Take care and, take care and stay safe until we meet again. Bye, Jeff. <laughs> We want to thank you for listening to January Jones Sharing Success Stories. Always remember Ms. Jones' personal mantra, if you can think it, you can do it. That's what all of our guests have done with their lives, and so can you. You are the ultimate success coach in your own life. All you need to do will be to start sharing your own story with your family and friends. We hope that our guest stories will encourage you to explore an equation in your future that will combine your creativity, plus connecting with others will enable you to be successful too. Always remember, your passion plus your purpose will equal prosperity as you explore the wonderful world of January Jones.